And here we have a, a, a wonderful panel, I think, to describe for us Europe's issues. I'm Stephen Erlanger. I'm with the New York Times. I've been lots of places, um, now in Brussels, as the European diplomatic correspondent. One of the most interesting things I think about today is Poland is voting. I mean, that's you know, one of these things that actually matters. And Hungary is preparing to vote. Uh, an another one of those things that actually matters, because it goes right to the heart of whether Europe holds itself together on issues of principle and rule of law, whether Europe decides to reformulate its idea of what it is to, to have integration. Um, and um, then we have all these other issues, which you all know, I think. Um, we have disputes over immigration. We have issues over Islamophobia. We have questioning of, from the Gilets Jaunes to the AFD to Brexit, which is a live issue that remains and which I don't think the European Union has yet absorbed all of, all of the consequences. Um, but it is already creating uh, new coalitions inside the European Union, um, and it's creating a kind of anxiety about the power of France, especially um, with Germany seeming so, so, so paralyzed now by its political impasse. Um, and by a coalition that, um, as they used to say about empires, uh, long ago disappeared but never went away. So, um, what I thought I would do with your indulgence is because we have so many wonderful panelists um, and so little time, I don't, I've, not, I've told our panelists not to stand up and give speeches for 10 minutes in a row because that's no good for them and no good for you. Um, I'm going to ask a few leading questions. We're going to try to have a conversation. And then I actually want to go to you, because this is an interest clearly to everyone fairly early in our discussion. So we have roughly, eight, roughly 80 minutes. So the first thing I want to do is uh, just ask the panelists when they think about the problems of the European Union today, what are the one or two issues, only one or two issues, I don't want them to talk for more than two or three minutes, that seem most prominent to them? And I thought I would start at the other end with the former French Foreign Minister, Hubert Vedrine. Monsieur Vedrine, s'il vous plaît. Merci, cher ami. First of all, I will speak in French. Bon. Préparez-vous. <rire> Donc cette langue est autorisée, bien sûr. Oui, exactement. Ah. Alors, je vais... D'autre part, je m'excuse par avance, je dois partir pour des raisons d'horaire d'avion à 45. Donc je ne serai pas là jusqu'au bout de la table ronde et je m'en excuse. Alors très vite, comme vous me l'avez demandé, nous sommes censés vous parler des incertitudes européennes. En fait, incertitudes entre Européens. Je pense qu'il faut distinguer les incertitudes immédiates, conjoncturelles, des incertitudes structurelles, profondes, peut-être même vitales. Et après, se demander que faire. Je ne vais pas développer tout ça, c'est juste une, une liste de sujets. Les incertitudes conjoncturelles, il y en a énormément. Ça saute aux yeux. Comment la nouvelle commission va être composée Qui la France va proposer à la place de Mme Goulard, qui n'aurait jamais dû être proposée, mais c'est autre chose comment, comment ça va fonctionner Comment va s'établir le rapport de force entre le Parlement qui va imposer sa suprématie et le reste Et que va faire cette Europe face à Trump, s'il est réélu ou à un autre Et que va faire cette Europe par rapport à Poutine et par rapport aux Chinois et par rapport à tout le chaos du Moyen-Orient et par rapport à la question migratoire, etc., etc. Donc il y a plein de questions. Oui, oui. Que va faire l'Europe aussi par rapport au décrochage technologique Ça, c'est toutes les incertitudes conjoncturelles qui vous saute à la figure dès que vous ouvrez un journal et que vous regardez une émission. Je pense qu'il y a derrière ça des incertitudes plus profondes, structurelles, voire existentielles. La première chose, c'est est-ce que les Européens vont se résigner ou non à construire une sorte d'Europe puissance 
que certains demandent depuis longtemps, mais qui fait peur à beaucoup d'Européens, même dans le contexte actuel. Deuxièmement, est-ce que l'Europe dont nous parlons va réussir à répondre au décrochage des classes populaires et des classes moyennes par rapport à l'idée de mondialisation, par rapport à l'idée d'Europe Ce n'est pas évident. Troisièmement, est-ce que l'Europe arrivera à se protéger de la crise mondiale de la démocratie représentative, puisqu'on est dans un monde où euh, les gens ne veulent plus être représentés, en tout cas dans le monde démocratique. Ils élisent quelqu'un le dimanche, et trois jours après, ils sont furieux. Ça devient presque impossible de gérer les démocraties modernes, et pas uniquement en Europe. Est-ce que l'Europe arrivera à trouver une, une réponse par rapport à ça Est-ce qu'elle arrivera à trouver, en co-gestion avec les pays de départ et de transit, une négociation intelligente pour gérer les phénomènes migratoires qui seront toujours là. Ça, c'est moins conjoncturel, c'est permanent. Donc, je pense qu'il y a deux étages. Et moi, je suggère que, quand on va se demander, quand vous allez vous demander, mais qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire par rapport à ces questions, auxquelles on pourrait ajouter le compte à rebours écologique, mais qui concerne le monde entier. Ce n'est pas un défi spécialement européen. Donc, je pense qu'il faut, euh, faut essayer de distinguer dans le traitement des défis conjoncturels immédiats, avec des, des réponses qui nous ramènent à l'actualité immédiate, et les traitements de fond, qui supposent un, de retrouver une crédibilité, une relégitimité des systèmes démocratiques. Et je termine là-dessus, parce qu'on doit être très bref au début. Euh, je pense que c'est très bien de faire l'éloge du multilatéralisme, c'est très bien de faire l'éloge du libéralisme, de la démocratie, à condition que ça marche ce n'est pas une question de « does it work ?». Ce n'est pas une question de, de, de religion. Mm -hmm. Donc on, le défi énorme qui est lancé à tous ceux qui sont dans les démocraties, spécialement en Europe, qui a donné beaucoup de leçons à ce sujet, mm -hmm. c'est de faire en sorte que ça marche et qu'on démontre au peuple qu'il faut adhérer à ce système, même si on le modifie beaucoup. Voilà un concentré de défis, à mon avis, et d'incertitudes. Merci. Merci, Monsieur le ministre. Thank you for sort of laying out these questions and making this important distinction between the pressing issues and, and, and the ones that are structural, um, because I hope we'll have time to um, really get to both. I think we'll just go down the line from you to Volker Pertas, who's the head of, uh, I'm not sure how to, how to translate it, but it's the, S, the SVP. Um, in um, Berlin, which is one of Germany's best think tanks. And um, Volker has been particularly, has lots of expertise, but has been very involved with Syria questions too. So one of the things that you might want to talk about is a bit of European foreign policy and, and, and defense. So Volker, over to you. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, S SVP, uh, you, you better don't translate. It's Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, which is a hard test for everybody who doesn't speak German. Uh, so we call it the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, which is, which which is, is easier, long. I think. Um, <laughs> Minister Vidrin has already sort of laid out the, the, the whole layer of uncertainties. And I think it would be fair to say, and you asked us what, what, what concerns us most, to say what probably of all these uncertainties concerns me not as much as other things. Um, ten years ago, we would have said the financial crisis and the economic situation of Europe. It's no longer our main concern. Uh, at some point uh, in these last ten years, we would have said European institutions. I don't think it is our main concern. 2016, I thought that Brexit would become our major concern. It would occupy us for many, many years and sort of divide Europe. That hasn't happened. Um, Even the migration crisis is, well, under control for the time being, and I guess we are a bit better braced today than we were in 2015-16. So there are a lot of things that don't concern me as much, even though they are part of these uncertainties. What concerns me much most, I think, is in an order of priority, you wanted us just to mention two, sort of the combination of developments in our strategic environment, our most important ally no longer being our most reliable ally, uh, unrest in our immediate neighborhood, which Europe has proven unable to deal with in a convincing manner, um, 
a big neighbor um, who has told us again that military power counts even in Europe, which we thought it didn't so much, and a rising power in China, uh, which is not a benign partner, but still has to be a partner because we don't wa want to decouple, uh, as probably some Americans think they should do. And the combination of these changes in our strategic environment with a rise of illiberal movements in our own countries. Uh, the two things, of course, aren't separable. Uh, they hang together, not directly, but indirectly. And I think um, uh, we already see in, in, in some countries um, that where uh, more illiberal movements uh, get to govern their countries, they are also much closer in their outlook to some of our adversaries outside Europe. So that is concerning for me. I think we can go deeper into what mm -hmm. Europe should do in this field, but I leave that no, that's, that's also quite a good start, because sometimes I think at the base of all this is really a Europe that isn't growing fast enough to provide the money required to keep wonderful social programs going, which creates a whole class of people who feel that their lives have been worsened by modernity. And, and that goes to the heart, I think, of quite a, a lot of these issues. Anna, I don't even want to introduce you. You've been everything. So, Anna Palacio, over to you. Well, you know, I had an idea to say a few things that I'm not going to say, because I think that, uh, thank you, Hubert, you have really presented what there is there for us. So I will make three comments. The first comment, I will go take the, the lens back from the citizen. In my opinion, what is more puzzling with our citizens, which has a repercussion in our system, in our, in our political system, this is this growth of the illiberals, is that Europe is the place of rationality. Rationality it comes from the Enlightenment, and we are supposed to, to make uh, ele I mean choices based on the interest. What we see today is the in the invasion everywhere of the irrationality, of the emotional. And this we have to analyze, and all our instruments are geared, because in the end, we are a legal construction. All our system is a legal construction. And legality is about predictability, and it's about certainty. And the opposed to predictability and certainty is emotions. And so this is, for me, one issue on which we have to reflect and reflect deeply. If I take the lens a bit further, I think that I, we have, and I won't go into it, in our, in our governance national, because we still are states. Even if some of us would like to be somewhere else, we are states. In our states, we have this challenge on how to transform classical party system that had classical agendas and that comes from the first challenge. But of course, when we go to the European level, I agree with the Bervedrin, we should, this is in our interest, create une Europe puissance. Absolutely clear. But honestly, we have to realize that our citizens do not follow on this idea of building more Europe. And you know what? We are in an intergovernmental moment in the European Union. The crisis in the, in the, uh, in the Commission is many things. First of them is the reflect of this intergovernmental moment when groups, the EPP, the group, the PSC group, the classical groups that made it forward, that by agreeing, by having a big discipline, are completely splintered. Yes. My third. Uh, my third comment, taking the lens, is honestly, this is not any longer our world, and it's difficult to adapt it. I mean, it's not a European, it's not a Western world. And you know, we, we say this, but we don't, we haven't interiorized this. So we have either the panic reaction or the overreaction, or, but I, I mean, Kevin Rapp was, I mean, I think that we have to, 
have clear eyes of what's coming, and what's coming is exactly what you have said. So our dependence on the United States, our transatlantic links, all this we have to rationally, and I will just end by yeah. this comment, which is a bit contradictory to what I, but rationally address. Thank you very much. Um, I often think, you know, the other great phrase is l'Europe qui protège, but I always think protège from what exactly? <laughs> I mean, who I understand, um, but what, from what <laughs> is confusing. So that leads me um, in a not very nice segue, possibly, to Artem Malgin, who is a, the rector at Megimo, one of um, Russia's great universities. Strasti, your floor is yours, sir. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Thank you. And uh, since Russia's uh, European identity is kind of ambivalent or split identity, I can give you uh, two lists of European uncertainties, what I consider. One is uh, how we see your mm -hmm. European, if we mean Europe by EU, and how we see European, if we mean a slightly wider Europe. So it's Brexit, mm -hmm. you care so much about it, but I guess it's return to kind of traditional, already existed in history, trilateral structure of the Euro-Atlantic West, and nothing new strategically happens in this case. Uh, migration inflow is still uncertainty, but I guess you've already got used to this inflow, and thanks God it stopped and now it could resume because of uh, what's happening in uh, Kurdistan, uh, in uh, Syria, with a, a new offensive of Turkey. Then it right-wing uh, parties, right-wing politicians, and even traditionalists. If women, Poland, for example, those who are still in power, I don't know whether they're going to keep, though it's, uh, their chances are really very strong. They're traditionalists, but those traditionalists, those who are nowadays Europe, uh, kind of really old-fashioned, and those who make barriers upon, um, let's say, greater dynamism of uh, Europe you know, for the development of the European Union. And uh, sure, here from Russia, there are two, uh, uh, two different attitudes. Once it's to follow your, let's say, kind of, uh, general public attitude that it's uh, it's a, a kind of challenge. It's something new. It's outstanding. It's all that stuff. Uh, and another, some of uh, the Russians they consider that they can play with these right wingers and traditionalists that are not always traditionalists are ready to interact with the Russians once again. This Polish case, Balkans uh, show sure, they are not any more uh, as wide as uh, there were previously such an immense field of problems. But uh, this bunch of Serbia, Kosovo, and Macedonia is still there. It's still an uncertainty. Then it's uh, Trump's uh, US foreign policy towards Europe that makes US more distant from Europe, that uh, somehow poses difficulties inside Europe. It brings additional problems when it comes to overall organization mm -hmm. of uh, world trade and makes all the agreements of EU with uh, its neighbors, traditional partners, including uh, African or ACP partners, uh, let's say, more complicated mm -hmm. since US behaves in the world trade system in an absolutely non-WTO, let us say, way. And uh, then another list, a list of, let us say, great uh, Europe problems. First of all, it's Ukraine. Then it's Turkey, because uh, Turkey provokes European problems outside Europe, but then they come to Europe again with more migration, exam again with unrest in the Middle East, again with uh, new, sometimes very surprising uh, unions, mm -hmm. alliances. Uh, when it comes to the situation in the Middle East, and it involves uh, the Europeans, and sure, Russia itself. Okay. Do you mind if I just come back? I'm just curious, 
Why do you think Russia is so attractive to European right-wingers? How do you explain that to yourself? Uh, I, I guess it's simply a very sufficient and wrong attitude because they simply say something that different from what uh, those uh, traditionalists, I, I mean traditionalists in, in Western European say, sense say. They say different things that the governments and uh, it's old fashioned game that dates to the between war periods to find out different awkward groupings and to deal with them having in mind their potential access uh, to power. But uh, yeah. I guess uh, both this attitude is wrong and uh, next that those awkward groupings, in spite of the fact that they uh, happen to be very uh, numerous, that they come at once in some periods to the European scene, that they are not, let's say, a kind of overwhelming trend in Europe. Spasibo um, Michael Lothian, Lord Lothian, um, we have a Brexit problem, but why don't you talk a bit about what that means for the EU and whether you think maybe Boris Johnson, whose words are always taken with a big pound of salt, um, can, can sort of pull this off? Well, I was rather pleased and surprised we got this far around the circle without anybody having mentioned Brexit. I know. That, well, would, that wouldn't <laughs> have been the case last year, I can tell I you. I think it's become, <laughs> that's right. As someone once said, we were afraid it was an infection, now we realize it's a vaccine. <laughs> I think one of the problems why we don't talk about Brexit so much now is none of us know where we've got to. Please, whatever. You know, it's one of those exa great examples of three years of people, highly intelligent people, negotiating with each other day after day, and at the end of the three years coming and saying we've got no solution. And possibly that over the next few days we'll find that Boris and a flurry of words will have found a solution, but uh, not one that I can see readily on, on the way. I think the other interesting thing is I don't have much difference with my colleagues here on when they say are the differences within Europe. I think we're all mainly agreed on that. I think one of the elements that I would like to sort of highlight is that when we say why are there these differences, why do they lead to populism, one of the reasons is on one side there are what a lot of people feel are the elites, the intelligentsia, um, who we, have, you know, we heard today from Anna, I think it was, that uh, in, in the end Europe through its intelligentsia must tell the people of Europe what they think they need. If you said to me what was it that caused Brexit in the first place, I would say largely that. There was a feeling in Britain, and perhaps more widely, that we weren't being listened to. When I say we, I'm not saying the politicians. The politicians were always playing and listening. But ordinary people, and they eventually showed it in a vote. And we've seen this in other countries where there haven't been votes. I wonder what the result would have been had there been similar votes. That they show it by getting out on the street or by protesting, or by raising matters in Parliament in a very unhelpful way. We've seen our Parliament brought, almost brought to its knees by parliamentarians, the so-called intelligentsia, trying to work out a way through the present impasse. Then I think we do have to go back fairly soon to saying to people, what is it that you look for from the European elite? Do you want to have some system whereby you can regularly be asked, what do you think, what do you want us to do about it, and we begin to answer that? And it's the answering of that that I think is the most important thing at the moment, more than Brexit. Uh, I think there are two areas where already we could be working to establish a common ground, whether we're in Europe or outside Europe. One is intelligence, because there is so much sharing of intelligence at the moment, which is not bound to the European Union. It's done on a voluntary basis. Now, we cannot see that in danger, because that would be very dangerous for the the Western world as a whole. I think we should be working out structures within which we can properly share intelligence and, if necessary, not sharing when we can't. Second thing which has come up before is the, what was known as the European Army. I don't see it as that. I think there is a very big void now in Europe for a military force. And I don't see it being a European one for the reason that there are certain countries who would not want to join it. 
There are other countries who might well say, well, the first time we have to take a decision as to what they should do, we don't want to do it. So we ought to now look at how we can begin to build a military force and a military establishment that brings in those countries that can really offer something positive. Those countries, by and large, and we know it within our hearts, are Britain, Germany, and France. And probably, in a certain sense, Poland as well. We should be looking now how we begin to form a structure within which they can operate as a group, not in Europe, not necessarily in NATO, but as a group which has a European common strand. Great. Thank you very, very much. And Enrico Letta, former Prime Minister of Italy, now in Paris as Dean of the School of International Relations at, at um, Sciences Po, um, who can, I hope, get up above nationalism and tell us really what, what is straining Europe in your view and what matters most, what needs to be fixed most. I, I think it was very good to have this session, Thierry, immediately after Kevin's session on China because I guess at the end of the day, our takes on uh, Europe as puissance, as Hubert said, uh, can only be shaped in the discussion about the relationship with China and the US. So in the new world in which uh, G2 is, is taking place, there's a new topic for Europe, and the new topic is being together. The alternative, the other option, is having just the choice in 10 years' time to be uh, singularly uh, an American colony or a Chinese colony. That is the big topic, and there's no other discussion on that. And I think it's, uh, it's the main point today. With 28 Brexit, the choice would be only for each of our countries to be an American colony or a Chinese colony. And I think Brexit was the idea of the UK to be in next uh, century, to be uh, the f 51st uh, American state or something like that. Uh, I think Europe can be a third superpower, only being united and only being united and taking leadership on two main subjects. And two main subjects are subjects for the future. And the two main subjects for the future are uh, climate change. We had a terrific panel this morning on that. And the second one is technological humanism, if I may say. And in the word, able to take leadership on how uh, to have good regulation, how to protect persons' rights. It was very good this morning. We had this point about ownership of data corporations in, in the US, uh, state in China, and person in Europe. And at the end of the day, that is the true difference, and that allows us to, to think to have a leadership on that. So I think we have to develop this point, and we have to take this leadership. Uh, so these two are, for me, the main subject for the future. And I think Ursula von der Leyen had a good choice having some competences for the vice president of the commission, having these two subjects at the very top of the list with Vestager and uh, uh, Timmermans on these two topics. There's a but on all this uh, discussion that is the fact that everything can be completely overwhelmed by this present Turkish situation. Yeah. I say that because I, I remember has the how the, the, the previous migration crisis raised, and it was with the Syrian uh, crisis. We underestimated consequences of the uh, mismanagement of the Syrian crisis, and we had uh, one million of people, and we had uh, completely disaster politically. I think, uh, we, with all the consequences we know, I think partially Brexit was also because of the images of jungle of Calais and uh, Cologne, uh, uh, the Italian situation because of that, and then uh, uh, IFD in Germany and Vox in, uh, in, in Spain and, uh, and, and the rest. So mm -hmm. my final point, uh, Stephen, is I'm really worried about what is happening because there are two topics. One is uh, Erdogan's threats, mm -hmm. but there's the second one. His threats to open the door, that's yeah. the point. But there's the second one. The second one is that if the war will continue, we will have Kurdish 
uh, immigrants. And that will be for us Europeans without enough new rules because we, during the crisis, we had two crises, financial crisis and migration crisis. For financial crisis, we fixed the roof, partially, but we fixed. We created the ESM, uh, we had many new tools. For migration crisis, the situation today is as it was five yes. years ago, it's six totally. years ago. We don't have tools. So right. my final point is that I hope we will be able uh, to face this threat. This mm -hmm. threat can be a disaster for Europe right. in the next right. 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 months. Right. Right. And I think on this migration crisis, we, we need to have new emergency tools and not to uh, look at business as usual tools, tools because they don't work. Right. Well, it would be nice to have a common asylum policy to begin with, but, you know, <laughs> never mind. Um, let's try to deal with the China question, since it was the question at lunch, it seems to be on, on quite a lot of people's minds. Monsieur Vadrine, do you think that, Enrico kind of laid it out in fairly stark terms, I mean, do you think Europe really does have to choose somehow between the U.S., and China, or is this a false choice, do you think? Bah, dans l'idéal, <coughs> l'Europe ne devrait pas avoir à choisir. L'Europe devrait avoir sa position. Et, et selon les sujets, elle serait d'accord ou pas avec les États-Unis, mais d'accord ou pas avec la Chine, elle pourrait même jouer un rôle constructif sur les, sur les nouvelles règles de la mondialisation qu'il faut encadrer un peu plus. Et ça suppose que l'Europe ait sa propre position. Donc, si elle n'arrive pas à avoir sa propre position, elle sera en effet condamnée à choisir ou à subir en matière de technologie. Donc, c'est très important que les Européens arrivent à définir une vision commune. Ça suppose d'avoir la même évaluation, ce qui n'est pas évident, du problème que représente la Chine. Est-ce que c'est un problème Est-ce que c'est une menace Est-ce que c'est une opportunité Est-ce que c'est juste un partenariat plus gros que les autres Déjà, il n'y a pas tout à fait accord au niveau de l'évaluation et du diagnostic. Si on arrivait à ça, si on avait quelques positions communes et quelques priorités en tant qu'Européens, il est évident que quasiment du jour au lendemain, on trouverait sur ce point particulier une vraie puissance qu'il faudrait utiliser intelligemment. Parce que quand on parle d'Europe puissance, Un thème qui se développe enfin, il s'agit d'une puissance raisonnable, bien sûr, rationnelle, etc. Enfin, et ça commence donc par un effort entre Européens sur euh, l'évaluation exacte, ce qui n'est pas encore fait. Right, right, exactement. Would others like to come in on this question? Fol Anna, then um, Folker. I, uh, in the ten points highlighted by by uh, Kevin lunchtime, from Xi Jinping perspective, the 10th is our priority f as Westerners and in particular as Europeans. And I would say as, uh, as Europeans, because our strength, I mean, we are back, we are not any longer on this idea of the soft power and the 21st century being <laughs> the, I mean, being the, the the era or the, down, the, the beginning of the era of law, but we are wired in legal terms. We are wired in institutional terms, which means that, th that I absolutely agree with Kevin. Uh, the, I mean, the position of China is to infuse new values to the existing framework, not to shake it, as Russia has tried to do sometimes, but in the end sharing the, the core, the core issues and bringing into a legal Western approach, rational context, uh, concepts like harmony. Ha, huh, okay, you know, it's, we have to understand this and to, to just be very clear about what this means. It's not just a nice word put into, and I, I'm taking just one example. So. Sure. I think that for us, this idea of, of power, and it was very interesting, this, this idea that this privacy or ownership of data, we bet on the citizens. We have millions or billions of allies that are concerned that they, their data, we need 
to be uh, I mean, to be consequent to 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 be I mean, to have to get the consequences of what we mean and what and stand by them okay. and just on this issue of China counter the subtle idea because when they establish other institutions okay you see that but when they come and they infuse different uh, concepts values principles in the existing institutions this is not perceived right Volker well, please Steve, I think if we were to accept this binary choice mm -hmm. that we had, if we were to accept that we have to choose the one side or the other, we would already have lost. We would have lost our whatever aspiration of some form, any form of strategic autonomy or European sovereignty or whatever you call it. And therefore I think we, we simply must not accept it and, and lay out, and I think we have good reasons and good arguments and good instruments to lay out that there are alternatives. Of course, China is a competitor. Um, but the question is, how do you compete? I mean, do you, do you simply geopoliticize uh, and militarize competition? Or do you say it is competition over a whole range of policy issues, which includes that you cooperate on some issues where you have a common interest, climate change, for example, but you compete over technology or you compete over social models. And I think the European Commission got it right in that strategic paper which it issued earlier that year and which probably doesn't have a 100% consensus in Europe, but a very, very wide-ranging consensus where they actually split sort of the policy fields and said, yes, China is an economic partner. Mm -hmm. China is a partner on some global affairs like working on climate change. China is also a technological competitor, no doubts about it, and what probably didn't go down too well in Beijing. Uh, China is a systemic rival yes. when it comes to issues of governance. I think saying that clearly and making sure that being a systemic rival would not keep us from cooperating on climate change. I mean, why should we sort of give up, cooperate on, on, on issues of mankind because we have a competition yeah. about models of governance? That is the way Europe has to go if it wants to assert itself. And my last point, we are not alone here. I mean, go to Southeast Asia, go to India, go to Latin America. And I guess there are a lot of, a lot of actors there. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's the young people who, who would like to have Huawei and Apple, or Apple with Chinese characteristics. It's also a lot of elites who would like to have American arms with China's, finance, Chinese financing, sure. if that was possible. I mean, no one wants to choose. So why should we be pushed into that binary Good. choice just by the US and China? Good, because I mean, sometimes what worries me is we're, I mean, a long time ago I wrote a piece called Needing an Enemy and Finding China. Mm -hmm. And I think there's this great risk at creating something that doesn't have to be there. And if you're thinking about climate change, I mean, China is now responsible for 40% of of CO2. I mean, people in Europe could heat their coffee by blowing on it, and it would make almost no difference to the fate of the planet. So dealing with China on these things, India matters terribly. Enrico, sorry, please. Just one point about the fact that this binary choice, in my, for my thought, uh, <coughs> is the consequence of 28 Brexit. Interesting. In case of 28 Brexit, each country has only a binary choice, to be a colony of the US or a colony of China. Being together, we can avoid the choice we can, we, because we can be at the same level on many uh, issues. We can take the leadership of some of these issues and we have to change our narrative on, on Europe on that because our narrative is still on some issues the same narrative of the 60s and, and the 70s. The, the Cold War narrative about peace, stability, and so on. That is no more, I think, the narrative with which you, you can deal with young people and, and the new generation. We have to clearly tell them there are issues where we can take the leadership only if we are united. Mm -hmm. if, if not, it's impossible to take this leadership, and at the end of the day, the choice for all the different member states will be to uh, be closer to the one or, or, or to other one. This is why, at the end of the day, I think uh, 
our choice is, is a very political choice. And it's a political choice in terms also of, of delivery, because we, if we're not able to deliver yeah. on some of, this, of these issues, it's, it's quite impossible. And for instance, on many of these issues, delivery means also the way in which we decided to, um, uh, to take decisions. For instance, I am in that period, I know it's, it's very difficult to say, I know it's, uh, it's very divisive, but we can't continue thinking that we have on all the different issues mm -hmm. to be at 28 right. or, or at 27. Right. I am a big fan of considering that two speeds Europe is a was a success on many issues. Uh, Euro and Schengen, two successes, two two speeds Europe. Mm -hmm. So it is not a blasphemy to say two speeds Europe on some uh, uh, subjects. We have to be, but we have to be very, very uh, concrete, effective in saying that we need delivery. If we continue to be too orthodox, saying that we can't have two speeds Europe because it is um, heterodox, no. at the end of the day, citizens will not be happy no. of the decisions and they will decide to vote for Le Pen or for Salvini right. or, or right. whatever. So yeah. it's a problem of delivery, of how to be effective in our decisions. Okay. In some way, some decisions, we have to take these decisions out of the treaties. I, right. I'm, 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 I'm very, I know it's a sort of blasphemy, mm -hmm. but ESM, the ESM was a decision taken outside the treaties because it was necessary in one night to take a decision. And no. the European Union needs to give, to, to give citizens the idea that we can protect them because we, can, we are able to decide and not to just to wait because of treaties, difficulties, unanimous decisions, and, right. and so on and Thank so forth. You. Well, blasphemy is good here, I, I think. Um, I'd actually want to ask Artyom a question, if, if I may, and, and then, Michael, I'll come to you. Artyom, do you think Russia's kind of new, what we call this, what Kevin called the strategic condominium with China, is this tactical or strategic? I mean, is it out of current sense of weakness, or is it some, I talked to Alexander Dugan the other day, believe it or not, sort of slightly mad theorist of Eurasia, and I can't tell how seriously anyone takes this in Russia. So do you think maybe Russia bends too far toward China? Yeah. And is it tactical or is it a long-term partnership, do you think? Look, I guess uh, in this kind of condominium, only you, the Europeans, you believe in this condominium. We don't, okay. since uh, we are much closer to China. And uh, even us, we don't know China to be good predictors, to have uh, really uh, adequate forecasts. If you look, you and us, uh, the Russians, we overlooked all dramatic changes through the post-Second World War history of China. It shows how we understand. And this perfect report, this perfect sketch of uh, Prime Minister Rudd shows to what extent of understanding of China we are. Not upon any other country we can imagine such a speech, brilliant speech, at a launch, just general day, uh, day main, uh, grand lines of the French foreign policy, or German, or Austrian, or even Russian. It shows that our understanding of China is still tremendously sufficient. We talk about binary choice, but whether Chinese do choose in the same way, they have India, they have Southeast Asia, they have many times more developed relations with United States, they have their African policy They've been overlooked by everyone, by the Europeans, by the Russians, by the Americans. And I guess our point of view upon the China here from Europe or from Moscow, I guess for the Chinese it's still the same Europe. It's, it's inadequate. And I guess um, here about condominium, where it's condominium? In Central Asia, in the Caucasus, over Mongolia, I see no space for this condominium. Relations with China 
to my mind, they're going to be much more complex, not European or Euro Atlantic style. It's from it's one point and another. We still have to understand what is driving force for the Chinese economic growth and when and because of what it can stop potentially. Put and since we overlooked yeah. so many changes mm -hmm. in uh, Chinese developments, I guess probably we also overlook the uh, margins, the barriers, let's say, the constraints of this economic growth. And if there are some of uh, these constraints, it ruins the, 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 the whole picture, uh, this very uh, frightening picture of nowadays uh, China and its okay. relations to the rest of the world. Thank you. Michael, please. I'm a bit puzzled by this. I think you've said it twice now. What do you call the binary choice? Uh, of the decision on Brexit between China on the one hand and America on the other. Because if you came to London or anywhere in the United Kingdom and you said that was your view of what Brexit was about, they'd look at you in total confusion. Because if that was the question, the British would vote for neither. The whole point about Brexit was to give ourselves more room for manoeuvring without being tied to major blocks. So I think if you say that this is the question that Europe has got to take into account, I would say to you that is not a valid question. Uh, we, we genuinely, uh, somebody said to me, why have you always appeared to be anti-European? My answer has always been, we're not anti-European, we're part of Europe. We've always been part of Europe, our history is European. We are anti-overdone -over bureaucracy. And if you want to see in the world the best example I can think of of an over overdone bureaucracy, you find it in Brussels. And the feeling in Britain was that to be told you could do certain things, you could eat certain things, or you could dress in a certain way was a decision for Europe, was something that got under their skin. When you say, why did they vote the way they did? In a sense, they were blaming the British politi politicians for not talking to them. It's only now, after the referendum is over, we're discovering, had we gone down and talked to them, we might have discovered a lot of these things earlier. Precisely. Enrique, do you want to answer quickly? No, ju or no? just okay. to say that I mean, uh, my point is not that this is the discussion about the referendum. My point is that will be the consequence in 10 years' time. In 10 years' time, with separation, with split of Europe, each country in 10 years' time, not today, will have only to decide whether to be an American colony or a Chinese colony with the split of the European Union. Well, uh, that, that is my point. I mean, Maybe I'm wrong. Enough. Maybe I, no. I can't see no. with the evolution, demographic, uh, in terms of economic power, the possibility of any of the European country to be able to deal alone with China or with the US. The only possibility is to stand all together. Okay. And this is why Carl. I think for, for, for the UK it would be a problem. Not today, I'm sure, and I know very well that the debate was on other uh, issues. I, I no, that's fine. I mean, one this sentence. is all understood. Michael, okay, Lord Hyman, I mean, honestly, you have explained the divide between the elite and the people. I mean, what you are saying on the on the Brussels being the big bureaucratic, it's what the elite in your country has been. This has been the anthem of your elite. So, I mean, I think that you as an elite, you should revise what you have been telling and what this idea of not having the, the right, I mean, being forbidden to have coffee ba or tea bags, not coffee, I mean, mind you, not coffee, tea bags, or this kind of thing. I mean, this is not the reality. We are not going to discuss bureaucracy in Brussels and its excesses, but I think that there you have, I mean, honestly, you as elites, you, you have to look at yourself. It's not that we do not have to do it in other countries, but frankly, on the Brexit issue, I had to say that. Okay, um, well done. Let's actually not keep going too much on Brexit because, act, I mean, we're in a kind of interesting moment where things might get resolved nicely. I suspect my own guess is there'll be a technical extension and um, for not very long, because one of the things quite clear to me is Boris Johnson would like it done before he has an election, which he also needs. 
but you know, everybody's got their own views, and um, Minister Vidrine makes his apologies. He had an appointment he couldn't avoid, and we got started a bit late, so I just wanted to express to you from him his um, deep regrets for having to leave early. So we still have about half an hour. I'd like to, given Poland, I'd love to talk a little bit about Hungary, Poland, rule of law. Um, you, you know, this is one of the great, you know, perhaps it's tied to the migration issue, it's tied to the identity issue, it's tied to lots of things, but can Europe at 28, 27, can Europe deal with this question? What are the instruments? Can it do better? Or is it better to somehow rethink the idea of what European federalism is to allow for more sovereignty, which might have kept Britain in the European Union had it been done earlier? So would, would anyone like to um, deal with this question? I so, and Michael, why I don't you start, off, start I since speak, I cut you off before, I apologize. I can only speak for myself, but I voted to leave because after 40 years of being told that Europe was going to reform, I got fed up with waiting for it. <laughs> but had somebody come along with a proper reform proposed, which would have given less power to Brussels and more power to the individual nations and their peoples, I would probably have supported that. De Gaulle used to speak of the Europe des patries, the Europe des nations. I was a fervent European in those days. But I, I am a fan of Jacques Delors' brand, uh, uh, Fédération d'État Nation, mm -hmm. uh, because I think it was a, a good synthesis. My point, and I continue on the blasphemy uh, mood, my point is that, for instance, on migrations and in the relationship with Visegrad countries, frankly speaking, we can't think we will have any positive and concrete effective solution having Orban at the table with the veto right. This is my point. If someone is, is, con is convincing on, on, on this point, I'm, I would be more than happy. But I think it's very complicated. So, for instance, on these topics, we need to have another treaty, a treaty outside of uh, EU treaties, signed by willing countries without Hungary or without Poland, I don't know who, the, other, the, the other Visegrad countries' position, but with the idea to have uh, a treaty with tools, uh, with relocation uh, framework, with meanings, and with rules, and with the majority rule to decide. Mm -hmm. Until now, we had evolutions in the, uh, on this topic, and at the end of the day, they are ineffective. They are not working. So uh, my point is that if we continue allowing those countries to stop the decisions of the others, it will be a problem for us, and it will be an European Union non-effective. So it is just one example. Sure. But just to tell you that at the end of the day, I think it's the only way to be uh, very assertive and to be also uh, clear with them. I know that there's a big difference between the funding members of the European Union and Visegrad countries in terms of demographics. Uh, funding members of the European Union, we used to be around 10% of our population is uh, from an immigrant uh, uh, origin, around 10%. Less, more, but it is around 10%. In, in, if I'm not wrong, in Poland, Hungary, these figures are 99 versus 1%. And the 1% is, is not coming from Africa or from Latin America, it's coming from the rest of uh, Central Europe. So at the end of the day, there's a, a very big point of uh, starting that is so different. Right. This is why I say we can't wait, we have to have new tools and we have to mm -hmm. decide. So this okay. new treaty for me is one of the urgencies of Great. this new formation, of this new political you. legislation. So it, is, it is worth saying, by the way, that Poland has many more immigrants than you imagine, but most yeah. of them are Ukrainian. Ukrainian, yeah. Um, so, but we, Anna and yeah, then Volker. Honestly, I agree with Enrico, and I think that the only way forward is a 
géographie variable. So distinct groupings in distinct tissues. The problem we have here is not migration. I think that what you were referring is more uh, the principles and values that are enshrined in Article 2 of the treaty. And in particular, let me say, independence of the justice, of the judiciary system, independence of justice. And this is something that we have to rethink. And maybe, you know what, diminish the, the area where we have judicial cooperation. This is something that we will have to address with open eyes. I think that the days have changed, and you know what? It could be done. We, we, we could go um, shrinking, and it, would not, it should not be perceived, and I think that we can explain to our, it to our population. So absolutely clear in new areas, we can adjust the 28, that's, and Schengen and the, the, the Euro are good examples of things that Schengen is clear, it was thought outside and then it was incorporated. And this incorporation probably should be revisited. And we have to do it, we have to do it. Uh, this is my perspective, because the rule of law is also changing, because the law is changing. I mean, we have to defend it in this context of China, of just weakening of the value of the law of other instruments, mm -hmm. uh, international treaties. Paris is not legally binding. This is a new system, and we need to understand that in cooperation, and I'm a dyed-in-the-wool uh, lawyer, European continental lawyer, but you know, you have, we have to be realistic. And in, yeah. in terms of European Union, let's rethink certain sensitive areas. Okay, Poland, you don't want, okay, then you don't, you are not in the Schengen area. You are not in the cooperation, in the, judi in the judicial cooperation. And we negotiate and we decide the alternative. Do these reforms to have an independent justice. Okay, Volker, please. Well, three short points, one, one I think on on Europe being so unreformable, that's a little bit of a, of a myth which, which probably helped to, to win the Brexit referendum in Britain. But I think the British Prime Minister at that time, David Cameron, was the one who proved that you can renegotiate a couple of important issues, like the question of uh, sort of social benefits to, to, to immigrants and their children who live in other countries. Uh, Cameron, he had a sound argument, and he got the consensus from the others, so things could be changed. And uh, that is what happens. I mean, it's a living body, and, and the European Union is always a work in progress, and things do change. And the bureaucracy in Brussels is not much bigger than that of a big city in, in Europe, actually. I, mean, I, I remember a Canadian friend once coming and saying, well, we are so envious that you are having something like Brussels because it means that your nation states don't have to have all this trade bureaucracy 27 or 28 times. So I guess you would have a little bit more bureaucracy in Britain after Brexit because you need your own trade negotiators now rather than sourcing that out to Brussels, who is doing it in the common European interest. But more importantly, I think on the other issues, either we actually have, as uh, the letter says, and Anna said, either we have a, a uh, sort of flexible geography or we have qualified majority voting on more things, including foreign policy. And I think both would be a way to overcome this embarrassing situation that in the UN or in the Human Rights Council, uh, we have a statement read by one European Council for 26 or for 27 out of 28. Uh, the UK is always with the majority here. Uh, and then of Hungary or Greece uh, saying, oh, we cannot share that because it is against China. So, so why not have qualitative majority voting also on foreign policy issues? I think that would be the way forward. And sort of the dialectic conclusion of that is, I mean, we complain so much about people saying that elites don't listen to them. But here we have something. If we would go forward with a stronger foreign policy, where the majority of the people in Europe, and we know that from opinion polls all over the place, would be with us. The so one thing where people want more integration is foreign policy and security policy. Mm -hmm. They don't want it in cultural policy. They don't want it in social policies necessarily. But foreign policy, security, they do all want more integrated Europe. Great. Um, I would like, I've got one more question, and I'd like to go then to the audience. So please think of some questions you might have for our panel. Are, 
Artem, did you just to comment a little bit upon uh, Poland. I, I guess I'll, I'll tell you just a, a short anecdote. A, a friend of mine from Italy once, it was before 2004, uh, he said, look, uh, it was a talk between two Italians. Look, the Poles going to join e e EU. And another one, he commented, yeah, the Poles is such Russians, those who write in, in, in Latin alphabet. And uh, you should understand the difference between uh, these parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they don't feel responsibility for the migrants that are not theirs. Yeah. They don't feel responsibility for these regions. They never had in common with the Middle East or Africa. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Do believe me. I. I, I can t tell this because my children, they 50% Polish and I speak so Polish. Uh, inside the countries, they say, in the West, in absolutely Russian meaning, mm -hmm. in your part of mm -hmm. Europe, most of you from the Western part of Europe. It, 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 that is why they need much more time to get used to this solidarity. Probably uh, Germany has not so much in common with Middle East as France, as Italy as Britain, but you already got used to this kind of sovereignty, and, uh, to this kind of solidarity and joint mm -hmm. common responsibility. The Poles, they didn't use. Yes. But at the same time, they consider as ours, them, uh, those who come from, let us say, even from the Caucasus, yes. from Central Asia, since it's not something alien, they simply have their, in their family histories, family memory that, okay, we had a Polish origin governor mm -hmm. in Georgia. By the way, his great grandson, he's a professor of our university, Professor Baranowski. Yeah. So it's another history. Yeah. And you could not force them. I don't, yes. I'm not such a specialist. No, 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 no. It, it's good. I mean, and also let me just add one sentence. I mean, one forgets. I mean, and you don't mind if I say this, under Soviet Union, they were under a bell jar for 70 years. There was no immigration and emigration under the Soviet Union in, from Poland. I mean, maybe you could emigrate a bit, but there was no immigration much. So it's all a bit of a shock, I, I think, and, and it does feed people who want to play on fears of identity and what's happening to the family and all the rest of it. I think given time, we've got about 17 minutes. I, I, I'm just gonna go to you. Um, I see Elizabeth Guigou, please. Um, and then Jean-Louis, and then Stuart. So let's take three at least. Uh, merci beaucoup. Je, moi, je partage le point de vue d'Enrico Letap, ça ne viendra personne. Uh, je, je pense vraiment que la seule façon de surmonter les uh, divisions internes entre membres de l'Union européenne, c'est de regarder le monde autour de nous. Il uh, y a la Chine et il y a les États-Unis, je ne reviens pas. Uh, c'est certainement, comme le dit Volcker, de nous aider à prendre des décisions le vote à la majorité est évidemment la meilleure solution. Mais ma question qui s'adresse à Enrico et à Volker, justement, c'est de dire comment est-ce qu'on fait pour euh, avoir des alliés à l'intérieur de l'Europe, de l'Union européenne, et des alliés à l'extérieur pour faire ce que nous souhaitons. Bon. Les alliés à l'intérieur, c'est qu'il faut arriver à trouver des façons d'unir de avec notre vision, les, les pays d'Europe centrale et orientale, je, je, qui, qui ont un, une autre histoire. Hein. Euh, bon. Et, euh, et d'ailleurs, quand l'essentiel est en jeu, ça marche. On l'a vu avec le Brexit. Et des alliés à l'extérieur, face aux États-Unis et à la Chine, c'est qu'est-ce qu'on qu doit faire avec l'Afrique On a tellement de, de défis communs à relever. Moi, ça, ça me paraît aveuglant, voilà. Les migrations, la sécurité, le climat, l'emploi des jeunes, bon, et des complémentarités. Voilà. Alors, comment est-ce que l'un et l'autre, si vous permettez, peut-être Anna aussi, que, comment est-ce que vous, vous verriez ça Parce que le problème, c'est comment faire, évidemment. OK. 
Okay. Monsieur Gregorin. Non, je me, euh, sur cette discussion, j'aurais dire que une motion de synthèse, comme on aurait dit dans un, un congrès radical, euh, je me sens en accord et avec euh, la, les deux priorités indiquées par euh, euh, Enrico et avec la nécessité absolument vitale d'avoir une politique de sécurité parce que qu'indiquait que, qu Volker. Euh, pour citer un autre, un autre responsable allemand que Védrine cite souvent, c'est la fameuse phrase de Sigmar Gabriel. L'Europe est un petit peu, enfin il dit de l'Allemagne, mais peut-être l'Europe, c'est un peu un continent, une union de végétariens euh, dans un monde de carnivores. Donc il faut quand même un petit peu euh, être un peu plus musclé. Non, ma question, c'est qu'il y a, me semble-t-il, on n'a pas parlé, et je trouve que c'est une insuffisance de notre euh, débat, non pas... La, on n'a pas parlé de la Russie, je ne parle pas vous, euh, Arthème, mais je parle donc, euh, les autres participants. Or, la Russie est extrêmement importante. Je veux dire, l'idée que parce que son PNB n'est pas celui de la Chine, etc., mais les rapports de puissance, ce n'est pas simplement euh, l'économie, euh, c'est la, la militaire, il y, a, il y a des liens profonds, historiques, culturels que nous avons avec la Russie. Et donc, euh, disons faire, comme on dit, l'impasse sur la Russie, c'est extrêmement dangereux. Or, nous avons une opportunité, et je pense que le président Macron euh, en est convaincu, il l'a saisi, il l'a proclamé, c'est qu'il y a une opportunité avec l'évolution politique ukrainienne, avec le contexte général, de sortir cette épine du pied, de trouver une solution sur l'Ukraine. Euh, Et est-ce que vous ne croyez pas qu'il y a cette opportunité Est-ce que vous ne croyez pas que sans se bercer d'illusions de séparer la Russie de la Chine, qui est absurde, est, qui est, en tout cas à vie humaine, ce n'est pas raisonnable, mais en revanche, de retrouver de la flexibilité dans le jeu avec une relation séparée et, euh, et dialectique, si on peut dire, de l'Europe avec la Chine comme avec euh, la Russie, et évidemment avec les états unis Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas là merci. une carte merci. russe à jouer Merci. Merci. OK. Et puis, s'il vous plaît, vous donner le microphone à M. Eisenstein. Je suis désolé. Et puis, nous allons revenir. M. Eisenstein, je suis l'Ukraine ambassadeur de l'Ukraine et de l'Ukraine administration. Un bref statement et puis une question. J'ai beaucoup de scores de la négociation avec l'EU sur les sanctions et le trade. En même temps, quand nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les problèmes majeurs, nous avons besoin d'un partenaire pour les and certainly in the public, for reviving a partnership that the President has said the European Union has created as an enemy of the U.S. So the question is, is there enough patience in Europe to recognize that whether it's in two more years or six more years, that there is a body of opinion in the United States that wants to restore this partnership for the great issues, or will you feel that you have to go your own way and decouple, to use Kevin Rudd's uh, opinion, from the United States, given the fact we have the greatest trade relationship as well in the world. Okay, thanks. Before we go, let, let's get Mr. Moratinos, former Spanish yeah. foreign minister. Yeah, thank you, because I we'll have to prepare to myself for the next session. Very shortly, I fully agree with Hubert uh, and Enrico. We need a European puissance. There is no other alternative, number one. The rest is uh, chaos, and we don't like chaos. Number two, how we create this new European puissance? With the founding fathers, today elites can meet in Brussels, but maybe they will not be able to go to the Salon de l'Horloge or Quai d'Orsay to sign the Declaration of Monet and Schumann. So we need maybe the founder's sons, the generation of Erasmus. They are the one who has been beneficial of what Europe has done. Number three, I agree with Enrico, we need to create a new narrative. 
And that's my question. What you are going to put in this narrative? Uh, climate change, I will prefer the EDG, it's larger. Uh, not only we all become uh, ecologists, but there is more than ecology in, the, in life. We need to have economy and we have other foreign policy, as Volker say, security. What are for you the new narrative? And final point, all the 27 have to be there? No, we should create a new Copenhagen criteria, a different criteria in order to join this new narrative. And the one who fulfill them, they are part of the club. If not, well, you belong to another group of friends. Great. Thank you. Another bit of blasphemy. It's wonderful. Um, let's go back to the panel, but try, try to be brief because I'd like to take one more round of um, questions. So would anyone like to deal with, let's say, the Russia question or Russia, Ukraine, Ma um, Macron's, I don't know whether it's, no. uh, whether it's actually a rapprochement or... Je mets ensemble les, les deux questions en français, je, je réagis en français. Euh, je crois que la question qu'Elisabeth posait sur la, les alliances est, est la question cruciale. Je pense qu'il y a eu une erreur en Europe au moment de l'élargissement, au moment et après. On a fait un discours un peu, en, en deux mots, néocolonial, en, en imaginant que ils entraient, je parle des pays d'Europe centrale et orientale, et en entrant, ils devenaient comme nous, sur tous les aspects. Alors là, je pense que ça a été une erreur colossale, parce qu'il fallait tenir compte de différences qui viennent de 50 ans d'histoire. Donc, ce que je crois aujourd'hui très important, c'est de faire un discours avec eux, quelques-uns d'entre eux, un peu comme on avait fait avec Thatcher, quand on a fait euh, démarrer euh, l'euro, euh, je, je, je demande le, le témoignage de, de Jean-Claude euh, sur le côté euh, gauche de la salle. Euh, C'est-à-dire qu'avec Thatcher, on a fait un deal. Tu n'entres pas, mais tu nous donnes la possibilité d'avancer. Je ne sais pas si le deal a été fait euh, d'une façon euh, complètement arrêtée, mais en fait, ça a été comme ça. Donc je pense que sur quelques sujets, ça doit être fait comme ça. Et ils, deviennent, ils peuvent devenir potentiels alliés de cette euh, dynamique. Sur les alliés extérieurs, je suis totalement d'accord avec toi sur l'Afrique. C'est un des sujets de, ce, de cette conférence. Et je pense que là, on est vraiment... On, a, on vient d'une de, décennie d'erreurs incroyables comme Européens. J'espère que la prochaine commission... Là, je suis très, très optimiste parce que je connais Joseph Borrell. Hein, Joseph Borrell est quelqu'un qui a l'Afrique dans le cœur. Il sait, il connaît ce que c'est. Il va faire un travail, je suis sûr, magnifique sur ce sujet. Quant à la Russie, question de M. Jorgorin, qui est, je, je trouve, absolument euh, essentielle. Euh, moi, je, moi je, suis, je suis optimiste par nature, donc je suis parmi ceux qui voient un petit pas en avant. Ce qui s'est passé il y a quelques jours, je le considère un pas en avant. Mais puisque l'accord de Minsk a été fait parce que l'Europe a joué un rôle, je pense que l'Europe doit jouer encore un rôle. Si on est euh, complètement en retrait sans vouloir jouer le rôle, je pense que la situation va rester comme ça sans qu'il y ait aucune possibilité right. de réaction. Uh, my final point about... Okay, but, but uh, about please, uh, be short, because uh, there are there lots of I'm, people. I'm very pessimistic, and I have to say just very clearly that uh, next uh, November 2020 elections will be decisive for Europe and for the transatlantic relationship. I can't imagine other four years of Trump Uh, leaving uh, the European Union and the US, uh, thinking that, okay, we, we have a rendezvous in uh, uh, 2024. I, I think it will be complicated. And uh, uh, a new China-Europe deal will be the consequence of a new uh, a Trump re-election. This is why I think it's so crucial mm -hmm. uh, to have a different uh, result next, uh, next November. I just to a footnote to what Enrico is saying, Stu. Uh, in Europe, I think that there is still a critical mass that would just, uh, would abide by this idea of, Ma of uh, Madeleine Albright 
of the indispensable nation. We believe that the United States is for us, for this international institutional system, for the rule of law system, the uh, United States is a, the crucial, the architect, the, all this. So this, but honestly, I would add another pessimism to the pessimism that Enrico uttered is that I think that the United States has changed, that we may have a bipartisan, a bipartisan agreement is a hill, but that the United States, and this is why Trump got elected, is not any longer th there. And that last note of just concern from a European voice is that this change started before Trump was elected. The change in the engagement, this idea that, uh, that was said of engagement, sh engaging shape, uh, and shaping it and just hedging, I think has changed. The, the foreign policy of Obama was already a precursor of what we are seeing in foreign policy. Right. The, the, I mean, it will be better in terms, formal terms, in terms of, if you allow me, uh, just well-behaved well president, a president that doesn't insult uh, the European allies. But you know, being an ally of yours has never been easy started to be extremely, extremely difficult uh, under the Obama administration, and frankly, today it's impossible. And unless but there's Anna, change. But it's always been fun. It's always <laughs> been fun. <laughs> yes. I mean, depending on where you were sitting. <laughs> well, I guess for, for many of us, it was more difficult under the George W. Bush presidency than under the Obama presidency, because the, the Iraq war not only was a major transatlantic issue, it also was an issue that threatened to split the EU itself. And my, I would like to, to sort of combine the answer to, uh, to Stuart, to Jean-Louis, and, and to Elisabeth. Um, we certainly don't want to decouple, but there is an enormous fear that we are being decoupled. And it's not a question of patience, and are we patient enough to wait for another year or for another five years? It is whether in another five years too much would have changed in the rest of the world to, think, to simply bring things back to where they were uh, then 10 years ago or eight years ago, and that will not happen. So um, always trying to be a, a positive dialectician here, uh, I think we have to be a little bit thankful to President Trump that he woke us up here in Europe to get our act together. And if we manage, under the impact of the Trump presidency, to get security and defense right in Europe, we will have a better starter position for a more symmetric and better partnership yes. with a new president and the US. And that is what I'm looking forward to. But that is not a question of patience. I mean, we should be a little bit more impatient, I think, uh, with ourselves and probably also with our allies. Yeah. As to the carnivores and the vegetarians, I think the vegetarians that survive best are those with teas. But uh, it's not about trying to do everything the Americans have been doing in the alliance before. It's not about a European strategic deterrent, but it is, I mean, that would be my priority, about a credible intervention capability of Europe in its own geographic environment. Because we can go on and saying that we are for peaceful solutions, and we are, and that there is no military solution in Syria, which we have been saying for eight years until there was one, not one that we wanted. We can continue saying that, but it's much more credible if we would have the capability to enforce another solution too, then we can much more credible work for the peaceful solutions. Elizabeth, I think your, your, your question needs an answer. How to win back allies also inside Europe? And let me give one example where I think that um, the current French president, French president trying to do the right thing still didn't jump far enough. When there was this summit in, in, in spring this year, between the Chinese president and the French president. And Macron did a big and good thing by also getting Juncker and Merkel to attend. I think he should at least have tried to get one of the Visegrad four also to be there. That would have made allies inside Europe for something where we know we are not totally on one page, but we could easily be. So, so I think that's a way to say, um, if, if we don't want the 16 out of the 16 plus one to tell us, the Germans and the French, that you are having your own bilateral relations with China, why shouldn't we? Then let's integrate them 
when we address on the highest level the Chinese president. Thank you, Volker. I'm afraid we're out, out, out of time. My apologies to those who want to ask a question. I tried to give time, time, time for questions, but never enough. Um, but we're running late, and I'm under strict instructions to just ask you to thank the panel and thank you as well.